Have you ever thought about upgrading to a Ridge wallet? Well, now's the perfect time. You probably all know the sponsor of today's video, Ridge, the wallet that's changing the game. Their new Hyper Lime collection is inspired by the fluorescent shades found in high performance gear, a hue that speaks volumes yet serves a purpose. From winter slopes and late night runs to Palm Springs tennis courts, this dynamic yellow plays an essential role in peak performance. These wallets hold 1 to 12 cards without stretching out, blocks RFID to prevent wireless theft, it's scratch resistant, has a lifetime warranty and a 99 day risk free trial with replaceable screws and elastics. And you can head over to their website and use my code Let's Read for 10% off at checkout as well. And key case enthusiasts can rejoice as well, because you can securely carry 1 to 6 keys that won't jangle around in your pocket. With over 80,000 5 star reviews, Ridge is trusted and adored. I swear by them, myself and all my friends have one and they're so sure that you'll love it too. Elevate your style with Ridge, where fashion meets function. And when you use my link in the description or pinned comment below, you can use code Let's Read at checkout for 10% off. I grew up on a council estate in the northeast of England during the late 70s and early 80s. It consists of three tower blocks surrounded by bungalows for the local pensioners, and although I didn't realize it until I started secondary school, the estate had a very rough reputation. Having grown up there, I thought it was perfectly normal for someone to bring an actual monkey home from the pub. Then, when it escaped, helping hunt it down with dog biscuits and bin bags became this big game of hide and seek. I thought every other kid used to wake up in the middle of the night to hear shouting and screaming coming from outside, and yet another intrafamilial brawl spilled out into the street. I knew that I'd just have to wait until I could see the flashing lights of the cop cars, and then it'd be quiet enough for me to go back to sleep. I also thought every other family struggled to put food on the table and sometimes it was perfectly normal for the electricity to go off for a day or two at a time in the middle of the winter. It wasn't my parents' fault. They tried as best they could, but my dad's disability payments barely lasted a week, let alone a month, and my mom left school with no qualifications, so her options were always going to be limited. I love them both, and I still do, but I made my own personal mission to never live like them. I worked my butt off in school, settled on dentistry as a way of making great money while maintaining a good work-life balance, and ended with a very middle-class lifestyle, with the friend group to match. As you can imagine, whenever I tell my friends or neighbors any stories about my childhood, it provokes a variety of different reactions. Some stories make them cry with laughter, and others just make them cry. But all agree that I should be very proud of myself for lifting my family out of poverty and I do mean poverty, while making a better life for myself. But there's one story I'll never, ever tell them, because it details something I'm truly and deeply ashamed of. I know that if I did tell it, some people would actually think that I did the right thing, or that I did it to protect my friends or any number of other excuses. But even all these years later, the guilt still gnaws away at me. So in a bid to pay homage to my Catholic ancestry, I think I'll try my hand at a little confession. Now growing up, my two best friends were named Margaret and Jillian. Me, Maggie, and Jill, as I used to call them, went everywhere together and we had a kind of mutually beneficial friendship. Maggie was massive, an absolute unit as my nephew might say. She didn't grow up so much as grow out and even then she was the tallest girl in our school. But she was also an absolute sweetheart so we got on like a house on fire. Maggie was bully repellent and she knew it, which meant that she took a lot of joy in making sure me and Jill didn't get picked on, either at school or on the estate. And this is why Jill loved Maggie so much. She wasn't diagnosed into her mid-thirties, but Jill grew up with celiac disease. For those that don't know, that's where a person is allergic to gluten, meaning they can't eat bread, pasta, or anything else made with gluten-based flour. These days, doctors can diagnose a child's gluten intolerance very easily, meaning they can adjust their diets to grow up strong and healthy. But if you don't diagnose it, and you keep feeding a celiac child gluten, 
It basically screws up their digestive system to the point where they have difficulty getting nutrition from really any kind of food. This meant that Jill grew up a total waif. Short, skinny, tired, and anemic. But much like Maggie, her physical opposite, Jill was just about the nicest person you could ever hope to meet. Which, combined with her stature, made her total bully bait. And so you start to understand why we were so close. Together, we were untouchable. We didn't have to worry about a thing, whereas most of the other kids had to worry about Ronnie. You see, Ronnie, which is not his real name, was about the closest thing our estate had to a boogeyman. Looking back on it, he probably was the product of an extremely abusive household and most likely had some kind of learning difficulty which only compounded his trauma. The result was that Ronnie became the neighborhood bully and he more than excelled in the role. I think maybe these days, Ronnie would have been taken into care and his parents given behavior orders to keep them from harassing neighbors. But since this was a good 40-something years ago, and Ronnie learned all his bullying tactics from his parents, most of the estate's residents just opted for the quiet life and did their best to avoid them. Ronnie would beat kids up, steal their things, hurt pets, vandalize the lifts, and think of something to lower people's quality of life and Ronnie would do it. He also had this habit of forcing people to eat things they didn't want to eat. Mostly, this was either mud, grass, or leaves, but over time, Ronnie graduated to less digestible things, like pennies or bits of glass. Luckily, he didn't actually get anyone to swallow any metal or glass, but it didn't stop him from trying. And as the rumors spread that Ronnie was now carrying a pocket full of pennies around, his reputation became more and more frightening. So then, in the summer of 1981, me, Maggie, and Jill were all 11 going on 12, and we were just about to start our first year of secondary school. Maggie was away at a caravan with her parents for the weekend, so me and Jillian had to make do without her. And that meant, instead of hanging around the estate to play outside, we had to go a little bit further afield to make sure that we avoided Rotten Ronnie, as we'd come to christen him. We settled on scrambling through the fence of some private playing fields about five or ten minutes walk from the estate. And thanks to the hedges, it was out of sight from the main road, and the one entrance that wasn't locked, which was nothing but a hole where the earth had been dug and the fence vandalized, was fairly hidden too. We thought we had the place to ourselves, and we thought we were safe. But we were wrong. I can't remember what game we were playing, but what I do remember is seeing Jill's face turn even paler than it already was when she looked over my shoulder and gasped. I turned around, and my eyes catch the bushes near the hole in the fence moving. Something was wriggling their way under the fence, someone big, and that someone was Ronnie. That was another thing about Ronnie that scared people. He was a hulk for his age. He was a good head and shoulders taller than Maggie, and he could have easily beaten her up if he wasn't so scared of her claw your eyes out while screeching bloody murder style of fighting. Ronnie was big, he was fast, and he was mean. And as he got up off the grass and dusted himself up, he saw me and Jill all alone staring back at him. We were trapped, and we knew it, and I'll never forget how scared I was. I was scared for myself, obviously, but even at such a young age, I could see how things were going to play out. If he came for us, we'd have to run. We had no other option. But I was much faster than Jill, and Ronnie only needed to catch one of us. Unfortunately, that's exactly how it happened, too. We tried to take him on a bit of a loop-de-loop -loop motion, you know, pull him over one way so our path to the hole in the fence was clear, but that didn't work. We ran, he chased, and he caught Jill before she was anywhere near the hole in the fence. I didn't have any choice but to run back, but there was nothing I could do. Ronnie had basically rugby tackled Jill to the ground, and when I got close enough to try and drag him off, he threw one solid punch at my stomach, and then I was on the ground too. Jill screamed as I tried to catch my breath, and then suddenly, her scream seemed to go into overdrive for a second before she suddenly went silent. Ronnie was forcing something into our mouth, something I didn't see until I was able to get to my knees. As he got up, Ronnie wiped his hand in Jill's hair, and I'll never forget how he had this huge smile on his face. I'd never seen him so happy, and as he started to walk off, very smug, I noticed Jill was spitting gagging and wiping at her tongue with the sleeve of her blouse. 
I thought he just tried to make her eat dirt or soil at first, but then I saw how wet it was. Not just from being in Jill's mouth, either. It had been soft and mushy beforehand. I don't think my brain wanted to even acknowledge what it was, but when the smell hit my nostrils, there was no guessing anymore. Ronnie had forced dog poo into Jill's mouth in an attempt to get her to eat it, and from what I could tell, he'd almost been able to do it. I honestly think the events of that afternoon was the most traumatic thing to ever happen to me as a child. Worse than breaking my arm, worse than when our cat got ran over, nothing else compares to the memory of Jill crying, vomiting, and shaking as I helped her get back home again. It was obviously an intensely disgusting thing to do, but what I didn't know at the time was that you can get really sick from being so closely exposed to dog waste like that. So the next day, when Jill was taken to the doctors and came home with pills that she had to take, I full on thought that she was going to die. Mom had sit me down to assure me that once Jill had taken all the pills she'd be given by the doctor that she'd be right as rain again. But in that time, she wasn't allowed to play outside as she had to stay at home and rest. Now looking back on it, Jill was probably just too traumatized to even think about going outside for a while and I don't blame her. Then, when Maggie got back from the caravan weekend, that was the first thing she asked about. Where's Jill, she asked, and when I told her what happened, she was furious. We'd always hoped someone would get back at Ronnie for being such a bully, but that person would surely be one of the older kids or a parent, maybe even someone in authority. We never thought it'd be down to us. It was way too terrifying a prospect to even entertain. But after the dog poo incident, we were furious beyond words, and knowing we'd never be able to overpower him if it came to a violent struggle, we began to plan our revenge. After a day or two of discussion, our primary plan of attack was this. I'd keep watch to make sure no one was looking, and then Maggie would go up to Ronnie and bash him over the head with a rock. I know, that's essentially attempted murder, and it probably wouldn't have worked either, so you'll be thankful to know that we didn't end up trying that in the end. But as it happens, I had a backup plan. So on the day of our revenge... Jill is still housebound, so me and Maggie go off looking for Ronnie on our own. Going from the hunted to the hunter was a thrill all on its own, and when we found him, Ronnie was playing on his own in a patch of woods near the river. I say river, it wasn't much more than a stream that snaked its way through the woods near some railway tracks, but since it actually got quite wide and deep in places, we just called it the river. Anyway, we see Ronnie wandering across the park towards the patch of trees, and we knew it was our big chance to ambush him, so we waited until he was well into the trees and out of sight and then followed him across the park. I remember how hard my heart was pounding as we crept through the trees looking for him and then suddenly, there he was, sitting on a tree stump near the edge of the stream. He was facing away from us and looked like he was just staring at the stream, presenting Maggie with the perfect opportunity to bash his head in. But obviously, as I covered earlier, Maggie bottled it, and then the plan fell through. In all fairness, it's a good job it did, or I imagine the aftermath would have been significantly worse, and Maggie could be tough, but she wasn't a savage like that. And me, on the other hand, the jury's still out on that one, if you ask me. Me and Maggie proceeded to have this silent back and forth, which ended with her putting the rock down and shaking her head at me. She was definitely surprised by what I did next, and I think I was too, in a way. But after a minute or so of plucking up the courage, I crept off through the trees towards the still, none the wiser Ronnie. As I got close to him, I reached into my pocket and pulled out one of those small pop bottles that used to be able to get for 25 pence. I don't think they're any bigger than about 150 to 200 milliliters in size, kid-sized things that they are, but that small amount of liquid was all I needed for what I had in store for Ronnie. I crept closer and closer, realizing that whatever sounds my footsteps were making were being covered by the rushing of the stream, which moved quite fast and loud in certain sections. I kept going forward, heart racing as I closed the distance even more, and then something dawned on me. Ronnie. Big, scary, bullied every kid in the estate Ronnie. Was crying. I couldn't strictly hear him crying, but he was. His shoulders were bobbing up and down in that telltale way that people do when they're in the middle of a good cry, and at some point, 
I was sure that I saw him reach up to wipe his eyes or nose, maybe both. I thought about what I had in the bottle, and then I thought about what could have possibly happened to have big scary Ronnie crying like a baby. I think that was the first time that I realized what a horrible life he had, that it wasn't all fun and games being the neighborhood bully. Part of me thought about just creeping back through the trees and leaving Ronnie to cry it out, but then I realized that if he heard me, he'd most certainly give me a chase. Then that thought bled into Jillian, retching and wailing after he'd forced dog poo into her mouth, and I knew that there was no walking away. I unscrewed the top of the bottle, took a few final steps towards Ronnie, then gave him a loud psst. No words, just the noise. Ronnie heard me and turned his head to look, but the moment he did, I lunged forward and squirted the contents of the bottle right in his face. Ronnie was so surprised that he almost fell off the tree stump. Then as I started to run back towards Maggie, who was already running back across the park herself, Ronnie started to scream. That morning when my parents' backs were turned, I took that empty bottle of pop and filled it with a mix of every noxious cleaning fluid I could find. I know that there was some bleach in there, but there was all kinds of other stuff in there too. Smelly stuff, probably ammonia or hydrogen peroxide now that I think about it. The idea was to have a nuclear option, so to speak. Something to fall back on if smacking him in the head didn't work. Obviously, we didn't want to kill him which is mostly why Maggie backed out of braining him with a stone, but hurting him, and hurting him in a way that'd have him out of action for a few days, just like he'd done to Jillian, that was most definitely on the menu. And so, knowing I wouldn't be able to rely on brute strength, and knowing that he'd likely catch up to me if I tried to run away, I got creative and came up with a rather wicked form of ad hoc chemical warfare, I knew it'd hurt Ronnie if it got in his eyes or in his mouth, and the closer he got to me, the easier it'd be to deploy it. So that's what I did. Made myself a little cocktail as a backup plan. Yet as you just heard, it quickly went from a backup plan to our primary method of revenge. But it didn't just work. It worked a little too well for my conscience. So, I squirted Ronnie in the face with a chemical cocktail, then we legged it back to the estate as fast as we could run. We tried to keep quiet about it and even came up with alibis that centered around visiting Jillian, who was still sick and staying at home. But once we were there, with Jill I mean, we couldn't help but let slip the revenge that had been served. We just couldn't help ourselves. It was worth it though. Jill was cheered up immeasurably and after we swore to her to silence and arrange the alibi, not that we called it that, but you get what I mean, me and Maggie went our separate ways, back to our respective family flats. I remember feeling nothing but elation, and my thoughts didn't extend much further either. I knew I'd hurt Ronnie, I'd heard the screaming, but I had no idea to what extent I'd hurt him, and I had no concept of just how much damage that chemical cocktail would do. In my head, the little that got into his eyes would burn a bit, and then he had that stream right there to wash his face, so in a way, he'd gotten off lucky. There was also the added peace of mind that came from knowing that he hadn't got a proper look at me before I squirted that contents of that pop bottle in his face. It was the perfect crime. At least, I thought so anyway. Later that evening, I heard Ronnie's mom call out for him around the blocks. I thought that he'd have made it home by that time. Sore, but otherwise okay. So when I heard his mum calling out his name, obviously getting a bit worried that he hadn't come home, I started to get a bit concerned too. The next morning, Maggie said that when she saw the police knocking on his mum and dad's door, she panicked and thought that I'd killed him. But over the course of the next day, the truth spread round the blocks like wildfire. Ronnie had spent all afternoon, all evening, and most of the night wandering around almost completely blind. Someone had found him wailing and crying, just like Jillian had been, unable to find his way home. He'd just been sitting on the ground, screaming for help every so often until someone came along to rescue him. Upon realizing what state he was in, this kindly good Samaritan called Ronnie an ambulance who took him to the hospital, which was where he'd been overnight. Apparently, it was still too early to determine the kind of damage that had been done, 
but doctors were saying the recovery period was going to be months and that there was a chance Ronnie might never recover all of his sight. I'd nearly blinded Ronnie. But do you know what the only thing I was interested in was? Whether he'd named me or Maggie. All I gave a toss about was if we were going to get in trouble. The memory of Jillian's torture was still too fresh in my head for me to care about anything else. Those next couple of weeks were very scary for me and Maggie. We were convinced that Ronnie would either belatedly named us as his attackers, but as more and more time went by, it became evident that he hadn't had any idea who had blinded him. I remember the day that I saw him out for the first time, wearing an eye patch and looking glum. Kids gave him a wide berth, expecting him to be out for blood, but it was a slightly different version of Ronnie that returned to the estate. This Ronnie was a bit more careful with how he talked to people. He was afraid of people making fun of his eye patch, so as much as Ronnie was still a bit too rough with smaller kids and still a bit too aware of his size, he wasn't the same bully he used to be, not by a country mile. He never regained all of his sight, at least he didn't by the time I was 18 and left for uni. He still had a milky patch in one of his eyes from where the tissue hadn't quite recovered and a milky patch I noticed all too often whenever we crossed paths. You might be wondering how I was able to look him in the eye after what I'd done to him, but I didn't have any trouble. All I had to do was recall Jill being forced to take deworming pills for weeks and how the thought of the little creatures worming their way around her stomach had quite literally given her sleepless nights, and any slim sliver of guilt I felt just melted away. It's only these days that I look back on what happened and genuinely feel terrible about what I did to Ronnie. What he did to Jill was awful, disgusting, and he should have been punished for it. But the punishment I chose for him was not proportionate to the crime. I know Jill could have gotten all kinds of nasty illnesses, serious illnesses too, from having that dog poo forced into her mouth. But the reality is that she didn't get sick. She got the help she needed and she was fine. What I did to Ronnie was permanent. I took a bit of sight from him and, to my knowledge, he never got it back. I think of that same rotten Ronnie who acted so bloody tough and who in truth was just a sad, lonely little boy. I think about him sitting on that tree stump, crying by the river, and wonder if that was a regular spot that he'd visit whenever he needed to hide that side of him. I think of him sitting there like that and then I picture me behind him, seeing him crying and just not caring at all. I think of that vengeful, hateful little version of me who was glad that Ronnie was crying and who was happy that she stumbled across such a moment of vulnerability so that she could use it against him. I barely recognize that version of myself, as I'm 99% sure that Ronnie wouldn't recognize the version of himself from back then either. I'm sure if we met again today, Ronnie wouldn't be able to recognize me at all, but I know that I'd recognize him. I'd know him by that milky patch on his left eye, the one I put there, so many years before. Growing up, I was a real piece of garbage. I was your typical East Philly trash. Loved the flyers, I loved the birds. I loved drinking brewskis with my boys and I loved fist fighting with just about anyone who wanted some. I had a lot of street fights that way and just like anything, if you practice at it, you get good at it. I wouldn't say that I was a knockout artist or anything. I just learned to take a punch and after a while, I got way too comfortable using violence as my preferred form of conflict resolution. At 23, I got into a fight with someone at a bar. I punched him in the face, he went down, but... Then instead of just getting back up again, he hit his head on one of the brass fixtures near the base of the bar, then spent the next couple of days in the hospital with a fractured skull. A few weeks later, I'm standing before a judge getting sentenced to two years in prison for assault and battery. It was a wake-up call, one I needed, and after getting out after just over a year on good behavior, I decided it was time to turn over a new leaf. I cut off contact with all my old friends, who I realized were no friends to themselves, let alone to me. Then after kissing my ma goodbye and telling her that I'd visit every weekend, I packed up my stuff and moved to another city on the east coast. Starting fresh was tough, but I managed it. 
I got myself a job at a small business, just four guys and a part-time secretary that helped deal with the calls that came in. I didn't meet her until the end of the first week, and when I did, I swear I'd never seen anyone so beautiful in all my life. She was taken, but that didn't bother me. I felt lucky to even be working with her. Just her smile and her voice seemed to make the day go by easier, so I figured I'd better just enjoy it and not entertain any ideas of getting her number or taking her out. Things went on like that for a while. I settled into the new job, got myself an apartment, even started dating a girl that I met at the grocery store on my new block, and things were going good. And then one day, our secretary didn't show up for work. Our boss said that she called in to say that she was sick, which made sense I guess, but the way he told me set off my bullcrap detector big time. I wouldn't say that I was a smart person, not in the bookish sense anyway, but I got a sense for when someone is lying to me and Although I had no inkling of why, I knew my boss was lying when he said our secretary, who I'll just call Linda to make that easier, was now sick. As time went by, I noticed that Linda used to take a lot of days off like that, and they were always Mondays. That might not have meant anything to the other guys at work, but to me, there was a sort of weird familiarity to it. My father was a drinker, and whenever his team lost on a Sunday, my mom and us kids would catch hell and Monday always had this sad, licking our wounds kind of feel to it. And Mom wore an extra layer of makeup to hide the bruises, and us kids were extra quiet in school, and just like with Linda, it was always a Monday when that dark cloud of aftermath followed us around. With that in mind, I had my suspicions over what was going on with Linda at home. I just didn't get any confirmation until the day she showed up with two black eyes and not enough makeup to cover either of them. Still being the new guy, I stayed back while the other guys comforted her. They knew it was her husband that did it. They'd always known, just like our boss had lied to me the time that Linda had called off sick all those times. I remember how our boss wanted to give her the day off, but she wouldn't accept the offer. Her husband had lost his job and was at home way more than usual, which meant that she didn't want to go back to him and risk catching another beating. She worked out that she could stay at her mom's place for a few days and that her husband would most probably stay drunk until he went looking for her, which bought her a few days to figure out what she was going to do. The guys were saying, you gotta ditch this loser, he's gonna kill you one of these days, and Linda would say, I know I'll leave them, this is the final straw, no more. But I just kept quiet, cause I knew better. Battered wives don't just get up and leave their abusive husbands. It'd be nice if things work like that, but they never do. More often than not, a woman is so mentally beaten down that she'll keep on going back to her abuser over and over again against all the good advice of her friends and family until he kills her. That didn't happen with my parents, but I can guarantee you if my mom hadn't left my dad when she did, I'd be half an orphan writing this right now. Anyway, the working day draws to a close. Linda heads off to her sister's or her mother's, and then, just as we were closing up shop, I asked my boss if I could take a quick look at the Rolodex in his office just to make sure that I had a customer's details correct. They'd asked me to call them the first thing in the morning before working hours. The last thing I wanted to do was get the wrong number and potentially mess up a whole series of sales. He said sure, then waited as I jogged around to his office and flicked through his Rolodex. I guess there might be people listening who don't know what that is, but a Rolodex was basically just a bunch of cards attached to a sort of hinge. Most people use them to write addresses on them, usually in alphabetical order, so you could just flick through them and find a person's number or address in the same way that you use your contacts list on your phone today. Only the thing was, I wasn't looking for some client's phone number. I was looking for Linda's address. Later that evening, I drove over to her apartment building. I know she wasn't going to be home, but it wasn't her I wanted to see. I parked my car, walked up to the buzzers, and began buzzing her apartment over and over. Her husband kept buzzing me in and unlocking the door for me, but I just close it, walk back to the buzzer, then start all over again. A minute or two, I can hear someone walk out of their apartment above me, and they sounded angry. The voice went quiet again as the person walked down the stairs, and I took a few steps around a corner and out of the light. When Linda's husband walked out the front door, yelling something about how someone's about to get a whoopin', I just stayed put, waiting for him to start walking inside again, and then rushed him. 
I wasn't looking for a fair fight. I wanted to give this guy the exact same chance he'd given Linda. So right when he least expected it, I went running around the corner, wearing gloves and a ski mask, and sucker punched him before he even had a chance to react. I had to make it look like something it wasn't, so I went through his pockets, yelling, give me your wallet. He didn't have it on him, but that didn't matter. I just needed his neighbors to think that he was getting mugged. And then I got down to what I really wanted to do. One after the other, I laid the guy's hand out and stamped on them until I could see bone. I made sure that he wasn't going to be doing anything with them for a while, be that hitting Linda, feeding himself, or wiping himself. And once I was done, he was crying like some baby, and I mean sobbing, bawling, because he understood why. After that, I gave him a good right hook to his jawline to put him to sleep and then got back in my car and drove back home. A lot of people might have felt good about themselves after doing something like that. I know we deserved it, and I'm not saying I regretted it, but afterwards I felt disgusted with myself. I had worked hard on not being that guy anymore, moved to a different city, changed my old lifestyle, but deep down, I was still that guy. Still that person who thought violence was a perfectly okay way of solving problems. As you can imagine, I didn't say anything to anyone about what I did. I realized that I hadn't done it for Linda. I'd done it for me. And it wasn't her husband I was beating up. It was my own father. And I don't mean that literally, of course, but that's just how it was. I hadn't improved her situation one bit, not in the long run. All I'd done is satisfy my own selfish desire for the only justice I ever really understood. But there was also unintended consequences. The attack put Linda's husband in the hospital for a few days, which gave her time to stop by the apartment and get her stuff. Then, with all her stuff, I mean all of her financials and things like that, she was able to get a divorce lawyer to drop some papers. She'd never done it before, on account of her knowing that it'd never be granted, and after what I did to her soon-to-be ex-husband's hands, I didn't think that he'd be able to sign the papers, not for a while anyway. But he did. By God, did he sign those papers. I don't have a single clue how, but he granted her that divorce. And as you can imagine, Linda did much better after leaving her husband. She carried on working with us, moving into a small apartment downtown, and over the next couple of months, we got to know each other more and more. I think I loved her even back then, but being so emotionally immature, I didn't know what I was feeling, and it took until some guy asked her out for me to step in and take my swing. I asked her out, we went for dinner, then we had a second date, then a third. I gave it my best to act the gentleman that I was, and in the end, it seemed that I proved the better man. We dated for just over a year, then I asked her to marry me. I told her that she was the most beautiful woman I'd ever seen in my life, that I wanted to be the man that gave her the marriage she deserved, and that I'd do anything to keep her safe and make her happy. And she said yes. And we've been married for almost 20 years now, and we share everything with each other. There's just one thing I've always kept secret from her. It's not that I don't think that she'd appreciate it in some way. Maybe she would. It's that I don't want her to see me like the same kind of man her husband was. The kind of guy who uses his fists instead of using his words. She thinks I'm the softest tub of crap on the face of the earth that I wouldn't hurt a fly. And these days, I think that might be half true. But there's nothing I want less in this world than to ruin that image that she has of me. Because if she believes I'm a different man, then I can believe it, too. Hey Joel, I finally ponied up and decided to tell you about the worst day of my life. And if it's okay by you, I'd like to remain anonymous for reasons that'll become obvious. I joined the Marine Corps at age 18 and graduated from Paris Island at 19, then was deployed to Afghanistan at 21 as part of a mechanized infantry unit. Our job wasn't so much to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the enemy, but more to act in a supporting role, kind of like a strong safety would in football. We'd move from place to place, either laying down fire support, forming a blocking force, or acting as a medevac when it was too dangerous to call in a helicopter. 
Being in a big armored vehicle was definitely a comfort in some ways, but seeing as the biggest killer at the time were roadside bombs, we had just about as much to worry about as the grunts in a lot of ways. Roadside bombs are scary for obvious reasons. They're cheap to make, relatively easy to produce, and in the right hands, they can be completely concealed in plain sight. Stand on one, and at best you lose your foot. Drive over one, and you'll be lucky if you end up in a wheelchair for the rest of your life. But there was one thing I learned to like about roadside bombs, and that's how they don't move. Come across some earth that looks a little disturbed, or choke point on a dirt road that looks a little too quiet, and you can bet some Taliban bomb maker was there the night before. But all you gotta do is stop your convoy, wait for EOD, then turn the big 50 cal machine guns on anyone dumb enough to shoot at us. But roadside bombs weren't the only trick the Taliban had up their sleeves. One time we were rolling around the green zone when our platoon commander called us to a halt. He had a sneaking feeling about the section of road up ahead of us and there's no local Afghans to be seen which was always a bad sign. So we stopped, some of us dismounted, then we kept perimeter while one of our guys walked ahead with a metal detector. We weren't expecting anything other than maybe a long wait for the bomb disposal guys, so me and my team just took a knee, got comfy, and enjoyed the little fresh air that we could before we were forced back into our vehicles. Then out of nowhere, we get a warning over our radios. There's a bomber in the area and he's hunting us down. The Taliban used to use these little shortwave Motorola radios to communicate. They're incredibly reliable, the batteries last forever, but they have a limited range and all we had to do to listen into their chatter was get a hold of our own shortwave radio. Our Afghan interpreter was usually actually sat there, listening into the Taliban talking about how they were going to try and kill us, then relaying everything they said. They'd try to use dumb little codes to throw us off, but they were easy to decipher. And that day, they started talking about how they had a suicide bomber with them. Their genius plan was to dress this guy in a blue burqa with a geobab, as in full body and head covering that has a little screen type thing covering the woman's eyes. He was going to get as close as possible to us, walk up like he's a lady asking for help, then detonate his explosives when he was in kill range. Given we knew their plan, you think that'd give us a better handle on the situation, but since we were in the green zone, the place with the most trees, most bushes, and most compounds, there were plenty of ways this bomber could sneak up on us, and if he did, some of us were going to die. Aside from the IED strike which occurred a few months after, Waiting for that bomber made for some of the tensest moments of our tour. Everyone knew that if they messed up, second-guessed, or lost situational awareness, it could cost people their lives. So as you can imagine, the levels of fear that we were feeling were astronomical. We all stayed as quiet as possible. The engines of our vehicle switched off as we could better hear anything that might be approaching us. And then suddenly, I heard something. It all happened in maybe a second and a half, and it couldn't have been any more than that. I heard a rustling in a bush. I saw it move. Someone in a blue burqa emerged with an obvious lump on their abdomen, and I fired six shots right at them. The figure in the burqa dropped like a ton of bricks, just hit the dirt right there where I first spotted them. All hell broke loose for a second, with a dozen different voices on the radio all wanting to know who fired their rifle and at what. My team leader had figured out what had happened by that time, so he let everyone know over the radio. Then our platoon commander came down the line to take a look. We were all still expecting to get ambushed because the Taliban would most certainly be angry if we shot their bomber without them even detonating their explosives. So while the captain got on the horn to report the shooting and tell the bomb disposal guys that we now had two jobs for them, we went back to watching our sectors again. There was this slight sense of celebration. People were telling me good job and all this other stuff. But we knew that we weren't out of the woods yet, so we just kept on doing our jobs and waiting for EOD. But meanwhile, our Afghan interpreter is listening to the Taliban's radio chatter and he's incredibly confused. We just smoke the bomber, but minute after minute goes by and the Taliban aren't mentioning it at all. We had to wait an hour for the bomb guys to arrive, and still the Taliban hadn't mentioned anything about their blue burqa's bomber. He told our captain, but apparently just told them to keep listening. 
It wasn't until the bomb guys arrived and they approached what we'd assumed was the bomber that we found out who they really were. It wasn't a bomber. It wasn't even a man. It was a young woman carrying a package of bread in her arms under her burqa. She had no idea that we'd heard the chatter about the bomber who was actually a couple of miles away targeting an Afghan National Army checkpoint and not us in the green zone like we'd assumed. She probably walked past a dozen American patrols before and never had to worry about being considered a combatant. Then one day, she steps out of her compound to take some bread to her neighbors, and there I am, scared, ready to shoot her without a second thought. I don't even think that I can really describe what I was feeling in the hours that followed. Just numb, I guess. Everyone was really supportive and said stuff like, sorry it had to be you, or I would have done the same thing in your situation. But you could tell it wasn't what some of them really wanted to say. It's like they instantly knew what I'd be burdened with. Like I just swallowed a pill right there in front of them that was going to slowly kill me over the years. One guy told me, you did the right thing. But the way he said it was more like, it was nice knowing you. I knew right then that I was done with the Marine Corps. I wouldn't be able to get out right away, but I was totally emotionally checked out after that. I did everything I could to keep me and my buddies safe for the rest of the tour, then asked for desk duty the first chance I could. Because almost everyone in my regiment had heard about what had happened. Getting the transfer to double 111 was easy, and I just wrote out the rest of my contract while taking the free therapy. I don't really know how to end this other than to say that I think about that woman every single day. The guilt never goes away, it's just something I've learned to live with. Our unit gave the woman's family a bunch of money and compensation, but I wasn't allowed to attend their funeral as they call it so I could apologize in person. I understand why I wasn't allowed. I wouldn't want to meet the man who killed my wife, or mom, or my daughter, even if he was about to hand me more money than my family could ever imagine. If that was the case, money would just seem like an insult like someone was making a sick joke trying to put a price on a human life. But that's what we did, and the family took the money. We gave that family taxpayer dollars, not a cent came out of my paycheck, but that's okay by me because I know there's a day when I'll have to pay for what I did. It's just not this one. What I'm about to tell you is something I've never talked about with anyone. Every so often I'm reminded that it happened and my skin crawls to think I did something so weird. I didn't hurt anyone, and I didn't do anything that might get me on a certain register, if you know what I mean. But still, of all the things I regret doing in my life, I think this tops the list. I was in a long-term relationship with a girl from the ages of 15 to 26. He didn't read that wrong, by the way, and it's not a typo. We met in our last year of secondary school, went to the same city for university, then moved in together once we graduated and were hunting for jobs. Ten years, seven months, and eighteen days we were together. We thought that we were going to get married, have babies, get a joint account, the works. But then one day, things just stopped working. And after a few months of gradual breakdown, we agreed to mutually end the relationship while we were still young enough to look for other partners. I don't really want to get into it any more than that. It's a really long and convoluted story and it's not really relevant to what I'm trying to tell you. The point is, we broke up and as much as I thought that it was what I wanted, I soon found out that life without her was barely worth living. Call it codependency or unhealthy attachment, but when you've had a literal life partner for more than a decade, not having them around can be a real shock to the system. We'd agreed to go no contact, which was probably for the best, but trying to move on with my life was so difficult that I sank into a bitter and lingering depression. My mate said that I was heartbroken, my doctor said it was clinical depression, but to me, it didn't feel like either of those things. All I felt was anger, bitterness, and contempt. If I was out and about, and I saw some happy couple walking hand in hand, I found myself with this intense, bile-boiling hatred for them. 
Jealousy played a part in it, I can't deny that, but I also had this attitude of, why are you getting invested in something that's just going to end up in the toilet? It seemed stupid, outrageously stupid. It made me want to run over to them, grab them and shake them and scream, stop wasting your effing time. But I didn't. I just did that traditional Kiwi thing of hanging in a quiet desperation and pretending I was just fine and dandy. But I wasn't. And it took what I'm about to tell you to realize that. So I knew I was depressed and I knew I had to do something about it so I took up jogging as a way of blowing off steam. It worked really well in some ways and I'd recommend it to anyone, but the sense of chill only comes after a run. During a run, if you're hyping yourself up with hate breed and cannibal corpse, you can start to feel very aggressive. If you're in a good place mentally, this is no problem, you can just channel it into your run and all is well. But if you're not in a good place mentally, well, you'll see what I mean shortly. I was on a park run, not my regular route, but a longer, more hilly one that I'd been testing myself with. It wasn't going great, and that aggression was quickly turning into frustration. Then as I turned a corner on the walking track and was presented with a secluded, circular patch of park hemmed in by hedges, I saw a girl, sitting alone on the grass, reading a book. I had stopped jogging and was catching my breath, just staring at her, thinking things along the lines of, who's stupid enough to sit in a park alone like that? Anyone could come along and just drag her off into a bush and do whatever they want to her. And then I started thinking about what those things might be. I'm trying to think of a way to say this in as, as sanitized a way as possible. But during that period of my life, I spent a shameful amount of time visiting a certain kind of website. These websites generally have names that aren't fit for polite discussion and usually ask if you're over the age of 18 or 21 before you're allowed to enter. Are we on the same page now? Good. Well, these websites I was visiting weren't showing you run-of-the-mill stuff. The content depicted some extremely graphic and violent things things I'd never suggest doing with my current girlfriend in a million years for fear of getting a smack in the chops. I don't even think about that kind of thing anymore, but back then, I was in way over my head with it, like to an unhealthy extent. So in my head, as I'm thinking about what some crazed maniac could be doing with this girl if they'd only come across her first instead of me, a lot of very unpleasant images began to flash through my mind. They got so graphic that I felt the sudden flash of raw, stomach-turning guilt, along with a deep shame that those things had never entered my head to begin with. I think I need to emphasize again that I'm doing much better these days and that I'd never condone or repeat this kind of behavior, but back then, I just didn't have my head together, so of all the things I could have done in that situation, I somehow landed on one of the worst options possible. I turned off the walking track and started walking across the open field towards the girl. She didn't see me until the last second, and when she did, I could see the fright in her eyes. There was this sweaty, overweight, unshaven guy, panting and red-faced in front of her, and she had no idea what to expect. She took out her headphones and asked if she could help me. All I said was, You shouldn't be here. Running always fries my brain a bit. Words come out wrong, phrases sound off, so what was actually intended as a sort of warning came out more like a threat. And when she asked why not, in this frightened little voice I told her, because people might want to hurt you. She was so scared I could see her shaking, and that was the point that I realized what I sounded like. So I launched into some speech about how it wasn't me that was the danger, but rather anyone else that might come along and see a pretty girl sitting all alone, reading, listening to music and not paying attention to her surroundings. Once again, what was intended to be an innocent heads up came across like I was indirectly threatening her, and as she started reaching for her phone, probably in preparation to call 111, which is New Zealand's version of 911 for all you Americans, I apologized, excused myself, then walk back to the track to run back the way I came. As you can imagine, I felt like the biggest creep on the face of the earth. That poor girl was just sitting there, minding her own business, and I'd injected myself into her day while feeling entitled enough to do so. I know that's not exactly horrifying on its own, 
but coupled with what I was imagining doing before I walked over to her, it all just felt so wrong. I felt like I was in the alpha phase of becoming a serial killer or something, testing the waters of approaching total strangers to see how they'll react, and after getting back to my flat and having a long hot shower, I decided that I had to make a change. I cut out the inappropriate online stuff, invested in some less woohoo self-help books, then set about clawing myself out from this abyss. It took some time, a long time actually, but accepting I needed that help was the first step on the road to improving my mental health. So, if there's anyone else listening who feels like they might need the help, there's literally zero harm in just getting the ball rolling. You might be very glad you did. And also, if there's a girl listening to this, and the encounter I just described sounds horribly familiar, then please accept my most groveling apologies. I'm a good bloke, but I was in a bad place, and I think I scared myself almost just as much as I scared you. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. I release new videos every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 7pm EST, and there are super fun live streams every Sunday, Tuesday, and Thursday night. I'd love to see you there. And if you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, r slash let's read official, or over email, and you might even hear your story featured on the next video. And if you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations and bonus content over on Patreon, or click that big join button to hear about the extra perks offered for the channel. And check out the Let's Read podcast, where you can hear all of these stories and big compilations and save huge on data, located anywhere you listen to podcasts. All links in the description below. Thanks so much, friends. And remember, I like grilled toes. <laughs>